Hey guys, Mr. P. In this video, we're going to talk about understanding B221, specifically organelles as discrete subunits of cells that are adapted to perform specific functions. We're going to talk about content statement. Students should understand that the cell wall, cytoplasm, and cytoskeleton are not considered organelles, and that nuclei, vesicles, ribosomes, and the plasma membrane are. The first thing we need to do when talking about this understanding is identify what are organelles and what aren't organelles. And even within the class of structures that are considered organelles, we need to talk about which organelles have no membranes, which have one membrane, and which have two membranes. All of the organelles have specific functions. And so our definition of organelles is a structure that is a discrete subunit within a cell that is adapted to perform a specific function. It's really, really important when we talk about cell compartmentalization to talk about why cells need to become compartmentalized in the first place. Cells need to become compartmentalized because they have specific functions that need to be maintained all the time. Organelles are these discrete subunits within a eukaryotic cell that allows not only the compartmentalization to occur, but performs a specific function within that compartment that is conducive to life for that cell. And within this table are a variety of structures that all are maintained in a eukaryotic cell. These three structures, ribosomes, centrioles, and a nucleolus, are three structures that do not have their own membrane. They have a specific function, but no membrane. These five structures have a single membrane, vesicles and vacuoles, the rough ER, smooth ER, Golgi apparatus, and the lysosomes all have specific functions and do so within a membrane. And then there are a variety of structures like the nucleus, mitochondria, and chloroplasts that have two membranes. And the reason for them becoming double membraned is important and we will talk about those later. When we talk about what a single membrane looks like or what a double membrane looks like, we haven't yet talked about the cell membrane in detail that will come in a later video. But for now, you should appreciate that a lipid bilayer, i.e. two rows of phospholipids oriented heads out and tails in, will produce this cell membrane. And organelles can have either no membrane, one membrane, or two membranes, depending on how compartmentalized it needs to be and what ultimately the function of that organelle is. So when we talk about a eukaryotic cell, you can see that it has to be compartmentalized. Eukaryotic cells, unlike prokaryotic cells, are large. They are very modern in terms of their architecture and their structure. They have organelles that most of the time have a single or double membrane within themselves. They have a lot more metabolic demand. Demand. They require a lot of individual functioning in order for that metabolism to be maintained. And when we talk about a eukaryotic cell, you've seen diagrams of eukaryotic cells in the past, but it is important to note within the context of this video that eukaryotic cells have a variety of structures within them that become compartments for individual processes. Eukaryotic cells are a cell that is compartmentalized, and the reason they are or need to be compartmentalized is because they have higher metabolic demand, they have higher energy demand, they are larger, therefore have a smaller surface area to volume ratio. In order for them to maximize efficiency, they need to have individual sections or individual quadrants within the cell for these metabolic processes to take place. Biological membranes act as barriers and regulate the movement of solutes. The membrane around an organelle creates a compartment with controlled conditions inside. The mitochondria is in charge of producing the ATP, which is the energy source for a eukaryotic cell. And really, ATP is the energy source for a variety of cellular structures, both eukaryotic and prokaryotic. If you were to contrast the function of the mitochondria with the function of the Golgi, completely different function, completely different structure, both of which, though, have a membrane and therefore can keep their particular function and their individual enzymes and enzymatic reactions compartmentalized within that portion of the cell. And while we're looking at specific structures that are considered organelles, it is important to note that some cellular structures are not considered organelles but do have specific functions that need to be maintained all the time. One of those cellular structures would be the cell wall. Since the cell wall is actually outside of the cell membrane, and that cell membrane is what regulates the entry of cellular components from outside to inside, and the cell membrane serves as a boundary between inside and outside of the cell, the cell wall sitting or residing outside of that cell membrane would be considered extracellular, and because it is extracellular or outside of the cell, it therefore by definition cannot be considered an organelle. The cell wall is incredibly important in the cells that have them. 
Not all cells do, some cells have them, but those cells that do have them, they are not considered organelles. Another structure that is not considered an organelle would be the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm contains the water, which is the solvent, and many dissolved solutes that perform many vital metabolic processes. However, it isn't specialized to perform one specific function, and therefore is not considered an organelle. So when we talk about the definition of organelles, like we had on the previous slide, these are all cellular components that have a particular compartment and therefore a particular metabolic process that they oversee. Since organelles need to have a specific function and the cytoplasm doesn't actually have its own specific function, it just contains all of the solutes and all of the enzymes that catalyze biological reactions and give the cell its shape and substance, it is important to note that it is by itself not considered an organelle. And the last one that is not considered an organelle would be the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is composed of many different types of protein, which are actin and tubulin. Actin creates the filaments, both microfilaments and intermediate filaments. Both of these would be cellular cytoskeleton components that are made of actin. And tubulin is the protein that is going to make the microtubule, both of which are proteins that make the cytoskeleton. It is not a discrete structure, so it is not an organelle. However, like these other two structures, it is vital to the existence of the cell and to provide the shape and structure and support of the cell. It just by itself is not considered an organelle. How have we learned all of the things we've learned to this point within the cell and how cells wall off specific metabolic processes and how have we as researchers gone about trying to separate cellular components into individual isolated substances in order for cellular research. Three ways, one of which is biochemical fractionation. Biochemical fractionation uses centrifugation, which is a centrifuge or a microcentrifuge that allows the extraction of organelles from cells. It works by taking substances, putting them in these microcentrifuge tubes, and then spinning them around and using centrifugal force in order to isolate or filter out specific cellular components by size. Cells are first mixed in a tube with substances that break down the cell membranes, and so when you put the cells and the cell components into this particular solution that is designed to break down membranes, it's going to individualize all of your cellular components, specifically organelles. You're then going to spin at high speeds to isolate different components by size and shape. And larger and the heavier cell components can be separated off at lower speeds and can be found at the bottom of the tube. Once I mix all of the cellular components into this tube and I first spin at a low speed, I'm going to get the largest and the heaviest and the most dense cellular structure to settle out first. That would be the nuclei. I can then take this pellet that forms at the bottom and I just isolate at that point the nuclei of these particular cells. Once I remove those and I spin at just a slightly faster rate, I then get the next biggest. In this case, it would be mitochondria. I then take those out. I can spin at an even faster rate and I get the next sample, which in this case would be the lysosomes. I take those out. I spin a little faster and I get the last thing that settles out and that would be the microsomes. I can then take those and I get just the cytosol, which is the aqueous solution found in the cytoplasm. Remember, by definition, cytoplasm would be the cytosol, which is the fluid, with all of the cellular components that makes the cytoplasm. If I take all of the cytoplasm components out, I just have the solution remaining, which would be the cytosol. This is really important. This biochemical fractionation or centrifugation is really important in isolating specific organelles for research. I can then look at these individual components. I can further investigate individual size. I can investigate individual structure and relate that individual structure to an individual function. But this particular investigation of the compartmentalization of a cell would not be possible without this centrifugation. Another tool for research would be the idea of chromatography. Chromatography is the separation of specific pigments, which could also be plant or animal pigments, carbohydrates, proteins, and amino acids can be separated. The way that chromatography works is that you will place a pigment on a piece of chromatography paper. 
you will dip the bottom of that chromatography paper or one side into a solvent. The solvent will begin to work its way up the paper and when it does that, it will take the pigments that have dissolved in the solvent and will deposit them on the chromatography paper and separate them based on molecular size. So your smallest molecules or smallest proteins, smallest pigments, smallest carbohydrates will travel the farthest and your largest pigments or largest proteins, largest carbohydrates, largest structures by molecular weight will travel the least amount of distance. So once I start separating these particular pigments, I can begin to see which one is small and which one is large. The third tool for cellular research would be the idea of gel electrophoresis. Gel electrophoresis works very similarly to the chromatography. It uses electrical charge, actual electricity, to separate molecules of different size and different types by passing them through a gel. It works very similar to chromatography in that the larger bands of DNA will actually travel the least amount of distance and the shorter bands or the smallest molecules by weight will travel the farthest. It is important to note kind of how it works. You have a power supply which is going to supply the gel and the chamber with a predetermined voltage. It's going to run from negative to positive and so our electrical charge will run in this direction it's going to take our fragments of DNA with the charge as the charge moves. And so these bands or fragments of DNA will move until they are large enough to stop. Once they do that, you have separated them by size and you can begin to look at the gel, usually under ultraviolet light or with specific specialized lighting. And you can compare individual DNA fragments to known samples or you can try to identify unknown samples from knowns uh, and look at inheritance or look at heredity. The molecules are separated based on properties such as size and charge. It is a viable tool for cellular research specifically in looking at molecular weights and uh, cell compartments. That's it for this particular video. If you learned something, give it a thumbs up. Leave a question in the comments. Subscribe to the channel. We'll see you.